So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, World Cafe of the Global Fellowship Initiative at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. My name is Laurent Siero. I'm a reporter and a journalist in residence at the GFI. 25 years marks a generation. As we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the GCSP, we wanted to show you and exploit also the diversity of the profiles and experiences at the GFI. That's why we set up a series of discussion, short informal format in the next three days on three different topics, starting today with technology and security with former and current members of the GFI. But there are many, many more events. So I'll invite you to check the GCSP website, that's gcsp.ch, to look at them and register. Due to this short format, we have 30 minutes from now. We won't answer any question today, but we'll collect them and your comments in the chat box uh, function, and there will be a follow-up by the GCSP afterwards. As this session is recorded for uh, GDPR compliance reasons, if you ask a question or add a comment uh, and you don't want to be identified by your name, you're free to change it in the chat function, either through an alias or initials. It is now my pleasure to welcome three distinguished experts that some of you may know quite well. In alphabetical order, Pablo Carrillo. Good morning, Pablo. We know that it's very early for you in the US. Oh, you're muted, yeah. So there we go. How about that? Yeah, that's that's good. Good morning, Laurent. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank. You. It's a privilege to be here, and, and good morning to everyone. Yeah, former uh, chief of staff of late U.S. Senator John McCain, and currently off counsel at the Defense and Maritime Security Public Policy Group at Squire Patton and Bucks, and uh, uh, general counsel and legislative director at the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Ricardo Chavarriaga. Good, good afternoon, Ricardo. Good afternoon, I'm very happy to be here and to have the, taking part of this event on the 25th anniversary of GCSP. Yeah, Ricardo is head of uh, CLARE, which is uh, the Confederation of Laboratories for Artificial Intelligence in Europe and strong advocate of uh, societal and human center use of technologies. And he's uh, working a lot on the interface between human beings and robots. And then Farah Hariri, good afternoon, Farah. Oh. You're muted. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to participate to this event. So Farah is a senior solutions architect at the um, artificial intelligence uh, company NVIDIA and a former senior fellow at the physics department at the European Center for Nuclear Research, the CERN here in Geneva. Before getting into the substance, we'll start with a short uh, first round of uh, very simple questions. Uh, where were you 25 years ago when the GCSP was launched? Where were you and what did security mean to you back then? Farah, you were quite young uh, back then. Uh, how would you respond to that? I was in Lebanon. I, I was born in Lebanon. I used to live there. And the second question was about my security concerns. Is that right? Yeah, back then, as was on a personal note. Just to be alive. That's, that's the most important. And Ricardo, what about you? Yeah, uh, 25 years ago, I was in Colombia studying engineering at the university. And um, there was a, this was a time where we had, uh, regarding security, the conflict between the government, the left-wing guerrilla, and the nascent uh, right-wing paramilitary forces. So it was an environment of uh, conflict between the government and non-state actors that was quite embedded in society. And as an engineer, uh, there was a warning call about the link between technology and security with the Y2K bug, the possibility that infrastructure that was relying on computers 
can be disrupted from one day to the next. And this uh, start to, to put in myself the idea the, of how fragile these systems can sometimes be. Thank you, Ricardo. And Pablo, what about you? Were you already in the, in the public uh, affairs or still a student or where were uh, you? No, I, I was actually still a law school student. Uh, so not paying too much attention to, uh, to public affairs, but of course back then, so this was um, uh, uh, once again about 25 years ago. So very much still awash in the glow of the, the post-Cold War national security milieu. So um, uh, unbeknownst to us, and, so, and of course that was attendant, had attendant to it, some occasional uh, asymmetrical threats presenting themselves occasionally. But uh, that was kind of the beginning of a period that as certainly in hindsight has proved to, proven to be very uh, uh, transformative. And that is the emergence of uh, commercially developed, uh, of, of the emergence of, uh, of commercially developed emerging technologies um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the private sector which has really reshaped thoroughly how we think about national security uh, issues uh, today. But I'm sure we'll be talking about more, more about that going forward. But around the, yeah, around the uh, uh, 1997 through 2002 timeframe, that was just starting to coalesce. Uh, so it's one thing that I think about certainly in hindsight. Yeah, we're, we're getting uh, more into this uh, uh, actually just now, but let me start with uh, Ricardo. Uh, I have to confess um, that I thought that the term artificial intelligence was younger and fresher than it, it is actually. 1956, that was used for the first time in the, in the US. But we have the feeling that in the last 25 years, uh, everything has accelerated. Uh, for instance, there was the, the first uh, human robots interface really between let's say 25 years and, and 20 years ago. And, and the, the box, the bots, uh, made their appearances as well. So how was the situation 25 years ago in, the, in that regard, Ricardo? Yeah, actually at that time we were already way into the process of developing what uh, are now called artificial intelligence systems. Uh, there were different uh, approaches to make machines that can learn in a similar way to um, biological entities and different ways to do so. So and 25 years ago we were probably at, at a moment where artificial neural networks, so algorithms that were inspired in the brain, were reaching a certain maturity, uh, generating many, many expectations that later on were not fulfilled. And this led to what is called in the, in the domain as the AI winter, where these technologies were somehow put aside with, uh, to the benefit of others. And in the last uh, years, we have a resurgence of these approaches. And this is a typical, pattern of emerging technologies. We have this increase on their on interest. And then there is certain disappointment. We pass this uh, hype towards a through of disappointment. And then they, those applications where this can, be, can happen and can have real impact, they start to develop. And very often what happens is in the public uh, narratives and the discourse, these technologies are not yet so visible until they reach either the peak of hype or the second ascendant uh, trajectory. So that's why we see now many of the things in artificial intelligence are as something new, even though the theoretical basis have been developing for decades, but the impact on society, we are start only to realize it right now as the means of production become more, uh, more democratic or at least more distributed and as the applications and the unforeseen events that these applications entail become evident to society. Thank you. Pablo, um, uh, how does that apply to, to um, the defense field and security uh, issues? Because as you said, back then, uh, we were just after the Cold War. Uh, there, were, there was that beginning of trend of, of internal conflicts. And for Western uh, actors, that was in that period period that we started with that uh, zero casualties warfare doctrine in a way. So yeah, tell us a little bit more, a little bit more about the state of play back then. Sure, Laurent, thank you. The, and by the way, very quick correction, I'm no longer serving as the general counsel for the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. They're actually a client now, they're a pro bono client. So uh, it's actually gotten better, so the, the arrangement. But the, uh, the, um, uh, oh, the, 
the uh, the Trump administration, but even more so the uh, the preceding Obama administration under the leadership of this of the then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter came to realize that in the Cold War period, the United States lost its dominance uh, in the area of technology innovation, which was it was was beginning to lose its dominance in the area of technology and innovation, particularly with regard to China uh, and Chinese efforts to modernize its military systems. Um, once again, in in the, in the post Cold War period, and so this has actually been a tremendous area of focus for the Department of Defense in particular, um, and that is how can the department. Um, um, work more collaboratively with the private sector to ensure the development of not only artificial intelligence, but other types of commercially developed emerging technologies that could be that could be helpful to the military um, and to see the nation's security. And there have been a lot of organizational efforts, legal reforms, legislative reforms that have ensued to, uh, to bridge that gap, if you will. The DOD in particular, the government, U.S. government is, can be a terrible customer, um, a very, very challenging for the commercial sector to deal with, um, and where much of the technology, technological innovation that we've seen over the last 25, 30 years has resided, has come from the commercial sector, this chasm between the commercial sector, uh, commercial developers, and the, and the government has now taken on geopolitical implications. And it's something, once again, that, that Dr. Carter uh, uh, was very attentive to in the Obama administration, the Trump administration furthered in some very meaningful ways, and that I expect the incoming Biden administration to be very focused on, particularly with the likelihood that Michelle Flournoy may be the Secretary of Defense, appointed the Secretary of Defense, and Bob Work, who's the co-chairman of the National Security Commission on AI, may see himself in a high, in a high uh, position of responsibility in the incoming administration. Just briefly, could you give us uh, two, three uh, examples of these uh, commercial uh, major improvements that were ma made in the last 25 years? Um, certainly, uh, in the, I mean, artificial intelligence is, is, is premium among, among, among them. Um, in, in the artificial intelligence space, vis-a-vis -vis the DOD, that was probably led by innovations uh, from a company called Palantir, uh, that was uh, about Peter Thiel, a, uh, a, uh, uh, a senior science advisor to the president that headed up uh, uh, many years ago. Um, many of the people, by the way, in uh, Palantir have now gone to a company called Andurel, uh, a Silicon Valley-based technology company that's also doing some very innovative things in the area of, of security, uh, leveraging artificial intelligence and, and drone technology. In the, in the area of space technology, I would, I would cite SpaceX, um, and uh, the degree to which that they have disrupted the, um, the, um, um, the, um, um, the, 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 the rocket launch industry uh, and capability for putting up military satellites, uh, but, uh, especially. Um, but even now, we're starting to see some, la some laggards, you know, a good amount of development in the area of, of 5G, of cybersecurity, and of cloud-related technology that the DoD is only beginning to start to embrace, which kind of underscores a problem that the DoD has in being able to harness um, the, these commercially developed technologies in a truly strategic way. So I think all of these areas represent really, really uh, important areas of, of, of activity and indeed um, transformation at the yeah. Department of Defense. Yeah, important, impressive to see how things evolved actually in just one generation that, in that Absolutely. Regard. Farah, I want to I want to address with you the question of energy and uh, this uh, relationship between uh, technology and 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 energy. Things also moved uh, really uh, massively in the last twenty five years. Yeah, I also like to add one comment sure. to, uh, um, to the AI evolution. Uh, being now at Nvidia, it's more even more clear to me that how the importance of computing powers was essential for the development of sophisticated AI systems. So actually, the fact that AI is also much more deployed nowadays is also helped by the fact that we have even more powerful hardware that can uh, address the needs of uh, specifically designed AI algorithms that become more and more sophisticated and will be even more so in the future. So this is in general terms for 
uh, what I think about uh, the evolution of AI now, in particular for the energy sector, coming from the energy world myself, I used to work for nuclear energy in particular, and now I do the link between the energy world and, uh, and the AI development at NVIDIA. Um, due to global warming, as everyone's aware, there will all, we're all going to be concerned by the energy transition. And the energy transition will be um, only possible through innovation and technology, or thanks to innovation and technology. That is, if we don't use technology to, uh, uh, to fight climate change, we won't, we won't be there in 2050 for the net zero carbon emissions target. And AI is going to play, play a role in there. Uh, digital transformation is massive nowadays in the energy sector, whether for nuclear reactors becoming more modular, more digitized, more virtual. We're working on virtual nuclear reactors at NVIDIA. Uh, whether for energy efficiency, uh, for problems in uh, buildings, because buildings is one of the, the most emissive sector in, in terms of CO2 emissions. So it's also important to have digital twins to control the energy efficiency of buildings, for instance. We have uh, applications that range from uh, uh, also uh, helping understanding the, uh, the design of the wind turbines, of uh, smart grids in general for the distribution system. I don't know if I've answered your question correctly, but there are many ideas in, in I'm not sure which one to select. Sure, sure. But just to follow up briefly, um, so 25 years ago, there was nothing of that, right? We, we, we really uh, saw well, uh, major disruptions. Is, 25 years ago, we thought that oil and gas is the, when you think energy, you think oil and gas. In 25 mm -hmm. years from now, it will be a mix of energy, of energy uh, technologies. There won't be, I think, one energy sector that will be, uh, th let, that will prevail, let, let's say, but there will be a myriad of energy technologies. Each country with its own resources and its own capabilities will have its own mix, but uh, we'll have to change first our behavior. We'll have to have other security concerns related to energy supply. We'll have to, uh, it will be a different picture, let's say than yeah. 25 years from ago, because slowly, slowly, we're shifting towards phasing out fossil fuels, knowing that fossil fuel is a major, uh, one of the major uh, energy emissive, uh, sorry, CO2 emissive sector. Uh, so um, going to a low carbon world is gonna be a necessity for the, ne for the next generations. Thank you. Let's uh, let's speak a little bit more about where we stand now. Uh, with you, Ricardo, uh, there are ongoing discussions here in Geneva uh, about uh, what we call killer robots and, and the way uh, human control must be kept or, or not on these uh, kind of devices. So uh, being an expert on that interface, interface between human beings and robots, uh, do you see that as the major concern right now in that field, or what could uh, what what other examples could you give us? Yeah. Well, there is a actually a huge competition about which one can be the the biggest issue to tackle. There are several of them, and um, so there is one specific uh, topic that you mentioned on autonomous lethal weapons that is generating uh, many uh, in addressing many forums and with. Uh, a push-pull uh, forces towards uh, whether having a ban or not having a ban, whether the, the embodiment of the ethical and moral decision should be should lie in the human or can be embedded in the in the algorithm. And but I think this this is part of a larger discussion on what are these, these decisions and processes that we are ready to delegate into a machine. How much do we, do we understand about how these decisions should be taken and in which cases we can encode that into an algorithm? If we take the example of the autonomous lethal weapons, uh, some people uh, argue that uh, the fact that the machine can 
take a decision based on the available data and removing the emotional aspects of that decision can actually contribute to have a more humane, uh, a more humane uh, wars. Whereas others say that this is uh, not really something that can be achieved, that there are several limitations on how these uh, automated decisions can be made and therefore we shouldn't go that way. And there is not a clear, a clear answer to that. So the, the, the main topic that I see as a, as a general line when we discuss about this, uh, these uh, systems is how do we make a team between the human and the machine? And these teams can have uh, the responsibility divided in many different ways. There are level of autonomy that we can give to the, to the device or to the artificial system. And uh, there are some cases where we have already somehow reached an agreement that this is feasible. If we think about airplanes, for instance, where many activities are already automated and the human intervention is very limited. There are others where the discussion is still ongoing. If we think about autonomous vehicles, where you know, we see a trend towards specific situations where it, people seem okay with providing that autonomy to the, to, the, to the vehicle, for instance, for parking or to staying in lane in a highway, but not necessarily in all situations. And then we have the other extreme, which are the autonomous weapons. But th this comes to this question of how do we delegate these decisions? And the answer to that comes from the knowledge that we have of how an algorithm and a machine reach a particular decision. How much do we know the, the system? How, can, how much can we predict how this system will behave even in situations that haven't seen before? And this is part of a new line of research where we are still at a very embryonic state of going towards systems that are as performant as the ones that we have now developed with, for instance, deep learning, but can at the same time provide explainability on how these decisions are made yeah. and can be reliable and transparent. Br briefly, when do you see these uh, technologies uh, becoming mainstream technologies for the common citizen? Well, some of them are already mainstream. We, we have already many systems that are automated in, in daily transactions, uh, but we don't necessarily see them. And uh, I think the, the question on when do they become mainstream is one side when, and is basically driven by when people decide that it's useful to do it. And we see now a rush for adoption, both from public bodies as for private entities that they, they are jumping in the bandwagon of artificial intelligence as something that can provide an impact and benefit. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these technologies are mature to be used in the wider sense. So yeah. one of the, the lines that is being discussed in governance of AI is how can we deal with that? Uh, technologies that we don't know beforehand how they will perform in the real world but we, we think that they can be useful. Uh, so how, how can we deploy them in a way that is responsible and that we can be attentive to any negative event that they can produce and we can be actually proactive to prevent this or at least to mitigate these effects. Thank you. Farah, could you give us some examples of um, uh, current uh, implementations of, of uh, that couple between technology uh, and, and even maybe uh, interface between human beings and, and robots uh, for uh, energy and, and climate uh, action. Where do we stand and what to expect? Let's say we, we're going to speak afterwards about the, the, the 25 next years, but in, let's say in the short term. Well, in the short term, the, the applications I am aware of, of course, you have on the in the energy sector, all the developments that are at the R&D level that benefit a lot from AI. And this is for accelerating, for instance, design of new technologies, innovations, such as the design of future nuclear reactors, such as the design of future wind turbines, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So you have different stages where AI can, can be helpful. As uh, Ricardo said, it's not yet at a stage where it's mature to have to be implemented at a large scale or to, to have uh, 
or to have AI, for instance, have control over a nuclear power plant completely. No, but we are using AI to accelerate some of the processes, such as the design of a reactor, the maintenance in robotics. We have a lot of AI already implemented in robots, in, but robots for maintenance, for inspection of the machines, for, uh, uh, let's say, for real-time analysis of of data that we use to understand the energy system, whether it's nuclear or something else. And in grids, you have smart grids that benefit from AI. You have, uh, in this, you have also in the distribution sector, uh, we're working on using AI to better understand what is the need versus what, we, what the system can actually offer uh, on the grid. And to better, it's all about better managing and analyzing data at this stage from what I see in the energy system. We're not yet at a stage where, uh, as Ricardo said, we can delegate to AI major tasks, but we're using AI to, most importantly, we're in a world where big data is important, right? And everything is going through digital transformation. So dealing with this data, feeling, understanding, analyzing the data, making sense of data is important. And this is how we're using currently AI, main in across the energy system. And also if we compare to other applications as well in outside energy, similarly, we're in defense probably as well. Uh, AI is used a lot to, um, to, uh, to help us either make sense of the data or accelerate some of the uh, um, developments that are uh, ongoing in yeah. the energy sector, it's going to be very important. Pablo, you, me you mentioned the recent efforts that were made uh, by both uh, um, Obama and Trump administration in that regard. Have we, have, have we reached a point where we can speak uh, of uh, technological uh, new Cold War between the US and, and China? And what, what are your clients Telling you, what are the main concerns uh, right now? It's a great question. Um, uh, my view, uh, and obviously all of these are my own views and not the views of my firm or my clients, but I think certainly in the area of cybersecurity, I think we are in a Cold War posture. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the operation uh, that was widely, that was reported by the New York Times um, um, Olympic Games, uh, where uh, the United States used uh, a cybersecurity attack to actually result in, 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 in physical harm to Iranian uh, uh, physical infrastructure, nuclear infrastructure in a way that you would ordinarily achieve through ki kinetic action, really crossed the Rubicon in very many ways. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff happening under the surface that we just don't realize uh, and uh, and indeed the the, the 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 exposure the vulnerabilities that nation states have in terms of cyber threats to their uh, critical infrastructure uh, and so forth um, it, it could keep one um, awake, awake at night I, I I think but I, I think what what one of the things that concerns me is an increased politicization associated with the discussion about China um, and technology. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong in terms of how that of how that discussion is being framed, but I think it may lead to um, uh, unduly aggressive policy outcomes that might not befit a relationship that's by its very nature very very complex, very complicated, and that requires acuity and care. Um, which I think we are seeing a bifurcation in the in the worldwide market for technology, particularly in 5G. I think we'll see it in AI. I think we're already starting to see it in cybersecurity, as particularly as a result of the pandemic, supply chain management risk, that is concerns about the integrity of supply chains that support IT systems that are used by the government has really, really come to the fore as a matter of grave concern that only, I only think uh, contributes to this discussion. Also, you're beginning to see some members of Congress actually on both sides, on the left and the right, develop political rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis China and technology um, that I think we have to be a little careful about. Um, they're starting to assert themselves in, term, in areas regarding privacy, transparency, and accountability, just with regard to AI, algorithmic bias, 
once again, all of these uh, the, the, these concerns, I think that um, I think will could very well at the end of the day lead us down a road where once again the worldwide market for, in particular, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and related enabled technologies will become bifurcated, and uh, the, the international political economic implications of which I think we're already we're just beginning to get a sense of. You're either with them or you with us. Yeah. Um, let's get the geopolitical implications of that uh, can be can be quite daunting, and technology is leading the leading the way in the, in, the, in that debate. Thank you. So let's take the, the the five let's say five last minutes to explore this new normal. You know that the one of the the mottos of the GCSP's twenty fifth anniversary is the new normal um, with the pandemics and and the related. Uh, threats, but also maybe opportunities sometimes, and and in any case, habits that we have to uh, uh, adapt to. Um, that's the long range question. In 25 years, where are we going to stand with that new normal? And how do you see technology uh, being an actor to navigate through that uh, new normal? Uh, let's start with uh, Ricardo again. Uh, in In 25 years, Uh, that relation, relationship between human beings and robots, where for, I mean, for the good, um, where, where will we stand in 25 years? What do you think? Yeah, well, I will answer with where I would like this to go in terms of technology. And the, the first um, aspect I would like to, to see developed is a, is a wider understanding of how uncertain emerging technologies are that they are not seen as uh, systems that are ready as, uh, as they de and then they remain uh, untouched and they, they will not um, do anything new in the meantime. So these are evolving, um, uh, they are evolving systems that will change across time that will also evolve in parallel with society. And for this evolution, to go in a symbiotic relation between the human and the machines is, um, is key that the different stakeholders understand the implications of using technology and have a um, say free freedom of choice of whether a technology should be used or not. And this is linked to the risk that Pablo was mentioning on the politici politicization of the development of technology as a geopolitical tool that can say, channel the evolution of certain services, of certain products to align with certain ide ideologies. So I, I think that it's important that we increase the knowledge about how these technologies can impact life, how, that we need to detach these discussions about the, the principles that should guide the development of these technologies from the political interests of specific actors being their state actors or non-state actors. Thank you, Farah. Um, th there are a lot of people that are making connection now between the fight against the pandemic and the fight uh, uh, against uh, climate um, uh, global warming and, and, uh, and also some of them who tend to oppose them. So how technology will be able to contribute to, to fighting against both Uh, challenges and and where will will we stand in 25 years? Well, today technology has allowed us to uh, to un re like let's say to see uh, understand properties of the COVID much more quickly than any other time, thanks to a lot of advancement in simulations in. Uh, Uh, in research in general, but in simulation in particular, in technology in particular. In using AI, for instance, we've simulated a lot of properties of COVID uh, recent that we actually showed very recently that helped also uh, having the vaccine much more quickly than any other pandemic ever before. This is for the COVID side. Now for the climate change side, also technology will help us like prevent a lot of catastrophes in the future and predict what will come. Now, what I think is in 25 years from now, of course, no one knows what will happen, but all will depend. It will very much depend on our education with respect to technology. If we don't want to be dependent on technology in 20, 25 years or the generation of today be dependent in 25 years, we have to pay attention to how we educate 
the generation today and the generation of tomorrow to technology and the relationship with it, like uh, also the something that Ricardo was was addressing. But it's really very very important to um, how how much we know about technology and how um, and how we understand it. Yeah. Uh, this will determine how how we deal with it in 25 years from now. Thank you. Pablo, you have the last word. Uh, it's interesting to see that President-elect Biden uh, selected as the DNI for the next, being the next DNI, uh, someone who actually was involved in the um, legal aspect of, uh, of lethal drones under Obama administration. And uh, is that a sign? Where will we stand in 25 years in all that art of government defense challenges uh, regarding technologies? I think that um, particularly as these technologies mature and are more effectively integrated into DOD systems, I think we are at a point where we're going to start giving the DOD. They've been doing this in the interim, but I do think that that the appointment that you just described, Laurent, does represent a high level effort just by the government to start thinking about the ethical implications of their development, of their integration, and of their use, I think, which is which is a good trend line. I think that we're in very many senses at an inflection point here in the United States, particularly with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, and it has a lot to do with how our economy is structured. So the big challenge, I think, is how can we make sure that there is strategic alignment between emerging technologies that are being developed in the commercial sector and the research and development priorities of the, uh, uh, in particular of the DOD, um, the, because of the laissez-faire structure of the economy, achieving a, 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 a really seamless um, alignment can be rather challenging. It almost requires the DOD um, or whichever uh, agency is heading up the effort. Um, folks have said that the DHS or the the National Science Institute should be should be heading up that call of government effort, but almost almost requires it that it conduct itself like a a, a corporate venture capital firm in terms of being able to for in terms of the technology uh, pondering, prospecting, and partnering activities that CVCs engage with in terms of their strategic investments over a six to ten year time horizon. That's fine, good, fine and good, but the government, U.S. government, has never conducted itself in that way, and yet the exigency for achieving that kind of strategic alignment in the face of Chinese dominance and and the Russian use of emerging technologies uh, for, for for military purposes um, is is severe. And this is an area where I can almost assure you there will be a significant amount of focus under uh, the Biden administration, particularly uh, if you see Michelle Flournoy or Bob Work um, appointed to positions of responsibility. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Pablo. Thank you, Farah. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. That was great to have you. Uh, we managed almost to stay in the 30 minutes course that we uh, decided before, uh, but we managed definitely to keep that informal format that we wanted. Uh, thanks so much uh, to our uh, viewers for having been uh, with us today. Um, I remind you that there will be two additional uh, uh, discussions tomorrow on uh, humanitarian uh, affairs and security with the same format, 25 years ago now and the next generation. And on Friday on uh, the regional uh, perspectives in Middle East and Africa. Thanks for having uh, watched us. Happy birthday to the GCSP and uh, see you tomorrow.